I'm Alex Bell, and this is To The Point. The teacher shortage across California is making it even more difficult for students who are learning English. Tonight, we're looking at the potential consequences of falling behind and what's being done to address the problem. And we often found that it's students that are helping their peers learn in the classroom. I like to do math. I like math too. Math. Abdullah, Faisal, and Khaled Amin are brothers, and well, they like math. We come to school, we play here. We, when we go back home, we eat and then we pray. Then we like play games with each other. Their days are pretty typical now, but things weren't always easy for these three brothers. I didn't know English that much, and when I like came to first grade, they like teach me English. The Amin family emigrated from Afghanistan to Sacramento in 2017 for security reasons. I asked Abdullah, who is now a second grader, what it felt like when he didn't know what his teachers were saying. Nerve-wracking. None of the brothers spoke English when they entered the Sacramento City Unified School District. They primarily spoke their native language Pashto, says their father. They bring the homework and they ask me how can I do and I will try to uh, help them and uh, sometimes I didn't understand. I look in search in the Google and try to find the solution for him. In the beginning was hard. How when, was it hard? Because no one around them to translate to, to them. For Faisal, a fourth grader, he says it was a scary experience. When I came here, I didn't know nobody, like even the teachers. So I was kind of scared. When I, when I came, there was nobody in our class, like, and, like from our country. There were like all of California people, like English. So I was scared and the teacher was trying to help me, but I didn't understand. Khaled, a sixth grader, says he relied on friends to help translate for him. They like called my friends to translate and they they, was, they were trying to make me like understand a little bit. This isn't uncommon at Pacific Elementary. Dr. Karen Bridges, the school's interim principal, says they've seen an increase in Afghan refugee students just in the last year because of the withdrawal from Afghanistan in the summer of 2021. People may not be aware of like some of the issues that they've, they've had and that they've experienced in their country and some of the trauma that they've experienced and understanding that trauma and how when um, they come over here, you know, some of the things that have happened to them, they, it, it can actually um, you know, affect some of their, their learning. But at the same time, when we look at these kids, they're very, very resilient. They want to learn, they're eager to learn, you know, they, they want to do whatever, whatever it is that they can do. Dr. Olga Sims is the director of the Multilingual Literacy Department at Sac City Unified. The department helps all newcomers, refugee and migrant students. We are in a, in a, in a state of emergency, I would call, when we're suffering from a teacher shortage. And then when you add that we're suffering from a teacher shortage and bilingual, teacher shortage. Dr. Sims says the district's Human Resources Department has been working nonstop to hire and recruit, even working with neighboring universities to find candidates from the credential programs. What you want to do is use language that is um, not a deficit language, but uh, a language that empowers students to be who they are and what they want to be in that classroom, right? We want to develop leaders in the classroom. We caught up with fourth grade teacher Curtis Stanfield in between his busy class schedule. Fourth grade is lots of fun. He only speaks English, but has multiple students who speak different languages in his class. We asked what it's like to teach while navigating language barriers. It does get frustrating for them too, because we read uh, left to right and they're used to reading right to left. He likes working in smaller groups. Especially with these newcomer students, uh, from Afghanistan and, and places is uh, I do small groups with them and we are learning specifically uh, letters and sounds, phonics, um, because they, the alphabet is totally uh, foreign to them. They have never seen it before. So we start off with the basics. And those moments when they finally turn a corner makes it all worthwhile. Well, we were just working and um, uh, like I had some girls that were reading some words for the first time and it just is such a thrill to see them uh, 
blossom that way. So they, I appreciate all their hard work. Online programs like Brain Pop also help teach English language basics, but still many students rely on each other. A lot of times we'll have another student in the classroom who speaks the same language but also speaks English. We do is we tend to sit those students together so that they can support each other. The Amin brothers are now helping their fellow classmates through an all too familiar experience. There was like a kid that speaks Farsi and he didn't know what the teacher was saying and then I helped him do it. Why do you like helping? Because it's more kind and more respectful and more responsible. Whether kids in their class need help fixing a computer or... She was trying to tell the teacher that I'm sick, I'm going home. The brothers make sure that the classmates have help navigating a new world. I'm proud of them. Kindness is something that each of these brothers have ingrained in them. We are Muslim. Muslim must help needy people in each field. And the boys were clear. They learned kindness from their father. Because he helps with me with my homework and he helps me with my handwriting. And I am very happy to say that the boys are doing excellent in school. We'll be right back after this break. We can't predict what the economy is going to look like in the coming months, but we can prepare for it. And over the coming weeks, I'm sitting down with financial specialist Shane Korea to go through the key phases for setting up your financial plan. Shane, so good to see you again. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, first question, what are the steps into creating a solid financial plan? Four steps. So the first step is taking a look at our relationship with money. Uh, everything from our past dictates the decisions that we'll make in the future, right? So budgeting, savings, like what was our relationship growing up with money? At the same time, you're identifying your goals in that first phase. Step two is risk management. Step three is wealth accumulation. And then fourth is building that legacy. What's the distribution of all of that wealth? So let's go to how do your relationship with money plays into your financial planning. What, do, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So, I mean, if you think about it, how you grew up, a lot of people, um, especially in the Latino community, everyone I talk to talks about how they didn't have these conversations with their family. They didn't talk about money in their household. So possibly some of those habits, money habits, didn't translate to adulthood, right? So the way you have that relationship with money dictates how you're going to spend it or save it, how adverse you are to debt, things of those nature. Yeah. And then I want to talk about risk management because is disability a part of risk management planning? Yeah, absolutely. The most important part, um, in my opinion. So for instance, what's your number one asset? If I were to ask you, what's the number one asset that you have? I would say my house. That would be, your I would house. say the most important. Yeah. Most people do. The most important asset you have is you, your ability to bring home a paycheck. So, for instance, if you were injured or ill, how can you ensure that your money is still coming through the door so that you can pay your expenses? That's taking a look at disability insurance, right? How do we make sure no matter what, my paycheck is coming through the door? So a little tip, if everybody's listening, take a look at your pay stub. Look on your pay stub and see if there's a line item, LTD, long-term disability. Most employers, will pay some sort of disability benefit, but usually it's only 60% of your income. I can't live off of 60% of my income. <laughs> yeah. And if that line item there says that your employer is paying for that benefit, you're then taxed. So imagine if you're injured or disabled and you're bringing home less than 60%, more like 40% of your income, how do you pay your bills? And that affects your whole financial plan, right? Yeah. So that's something that's really important in risk management. Yeah, well, there's a lot, lot more to talk about with yeah. you, Shane. And like I said, over the coming weeks, we definitely will be diving into this deeper. You can find more financial tips and all the conversations that we're going to have with Shane on abc10.com slash to the point. South Sacramento's Franklin Boulevard is home to businesses that have been family run for generations. Photojournalist Xavier URT met up with a few of them ahead of the Back to the Boulevard Festival, which is happening this weekend. He found out that Franklin Boulevard is a place where history and culture live on through food and family legacy.
Franklin Boulevard was declared the ugliest street in Sacramento. And we took that personal. A lot of people were actually scared to come to Franklin Boulevard because they had a, had a bad reputation. But the reputation wasn't from Fruit Ridge to here. It was Fruit Ridge beyond. There's a lot of culture here. Um, different. We have Vietnamese restaurants. We have clothing stores. Franklin Boulevard has been a great opportunity for us to grow. We decided to stay here and, 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 and continue building here you know, on the boulevard. My grandfather was a master baker, and that was his passion. And between um, himself, my father, my two aunts, and other family members, we've grown it into what it is today. He immigrated from Mexico, and when he came, he um, first started working at La Fiesta Bakery, and then he opened up his own here at La Esperanza Bakery. In Mexico, he had um, opened a couple bakeries, and then um, the gentleman who owned um, La Fiesta Bakery was a, a mentor to him. Just working hard, saving, and just starting off small. Literally, it was maybe 800 feet. He was himself, two other bakers. He was wonderful at what he did, and I think uh, the community loved that we were here. Through his work, it helped us grow to what it is today. People are always surprised when they like when they come, like, oh my God, Franklin, we didn't know that you had this type of store. We didn't know you had this grocery store that sold this type of candy. The people that live around here, like we, ha we have clients that have seen us when we were 15 years old till now. So they've been with us for over 20, 30 years. We always have each other's back. Um, we help out people here as well. You know, we love to give back to certain um, schools here. I think, once you actually visit and see what it has to offer, you, you have a lot of new people coming in and they get a sense of community. And I think that's one of the things they just think, oh, South Sac, it's, you know, it's a rough type, uh, neighborhood, but there's a lot of great people around here that we all help each other. And I think that's one thing that uh, people would, uh, would be surprised about how, how close niche Franklin Boulevard is. 52 years in July. We've been, the restaurant has been open and I've been here since the first day. When my father, uh, he was a, a butcher. So then when he had uh, many friends that were in, in the bar business and he used to go visit them in restaurants. But my father was always one that wanted to better himself. He asked my brother who was 17 that time, was he was a senior in high school, what do you plan on doing? And my brother really had nothing said to what he was going to do and he goes okay he goes i'm going to put you in business you're going to have a restaurant and so we knew a little bit about restaurants we were young but we worked in the basement cutting meat and, and collecting beer bottles but my older brother he actually helped in the kitchen so he had an idea my father named it el novillero and a novillero is a apprentice bullfighter and what happened was at the time that my dad owned the matter or a matter is the matador professional bullfighter since we were young at that time, just starting, he named us El Novillero, which is a novice bullfighter. So it tied in with the, with the, the next door as a manager. You know, I was 14, my brother was going to be 16, and the owner was only 17. So we were the, we were the novice, and it ties in good. At the, at the beginning, I didn't even know what a Novillero was. I never heard of the name, but it grew on us. And then after we learned the meaning, we, we liked it. My father was so loved. When he passed away, we went to the cemetery after the mass. There was many mariachis, many people that knew my father, but they're all waiting for him. I just gave my dad a big tribute. And nobody told him about my father. They just knew about him. I think it was close to 12 years now, cancer. My father, I believe my father was uh, 86 at that time. But even when my father was going through cancer, he was a proud man. He worked every day. He had a, a property, a ranch, and he loved his ranch. And every day he would work and do something, do something to better the ranch until the day he died. So 
So X6 Tacos is a business that started in 2020. The beginning when we started, it's when the whole pandemic started. So our business was extremely slow. But starting last year in 2021 in May, it's when we did our first pop-up event with the community. From last year to this year, uh, we've been able to go from just one van to two vans, a taco stand. We're going now to Collectible, so we've gone um, very far in the last year. So it's been a great opportunity for us to grow, especially working with the Franklin Boulevard District. It probably would have taken us a way longer time to get to where we are right now. Without them, that we probably wouldn't have that opportunity right now. So it's been a great, great um, help for us as a business. I was born here in Sacramento, but I grew up in Mexico. So I came back to the U.S. when I was uh, a teenager at 17. When I was 18, I joined the U.S. Navy. So I was able to serve for four years in the U.S. Navy. After that, I went to college and I got my degree in biology. I started working in UC Davis as a chemist in a chemistry lab, but my brother and I wanted to start a business. My mom back home in Mexico, she had a taco food stand. So we wanted to create something for ourselves to have our own business here in this country. So we're both focusing completely on the business and it's been a great experience and we look forward to what we have, um, God has for us in the future. And all of that food from XX Tacos will be at the Back to the Boulevard event happening this Sunday. And yes, it will be taking place rain or shine. There will be cars, food, live music, and even a historic lowrider exhibit. We have everything you need to know on abc10.com slash to the point. You already know it's Friday, so it's time to hit the back roads. And this week, John Bartell takes us to the presumed capital of what some people hope will be the next U.S. state. And yeah, it's right here in Northern California. Northern California has a lot of natural resources that the entire state depends on. A lot of water, a lot of lumber, and a lot of minerals. But you know what Northern California doesn't have a lot of? We do not have any representation in the big cities make the rules and the laws. Grace Bennett is the president of the Siskiyou County Museum, home to the state of Jefferson display. Uh, what's the state of Jefferson, you ask? The goal is to be able to govern ourselves. In simple terms, Grace is talking about secession, a movement to make the state of Jefferson the nation's 51st state, and Wairika as its state capital. What started this whole movement? The, I think the roads. The bad roads, roads. Bad roads. Fed up with the lack of maintenance and road construction, about a dozen counties in Northern California and Southern Oregon started the State of Jefferson movement in 1941 so they could call out the inaction of politicians in each state. So you were saying they would stop traffic on yeah, Highway um, 99? Yeah, they would stop traffic. In the early days, gun-toting leaders of the movement gained support by standing in roads handing out petitions to commuters. They hostile at all or? No, no. The state of Jefferson was named after the Declaration of Independence writer Thomas Jefferson, who hated the idea of taxation without representation. To locals, secession made sense, but to the federal government, they had other priorities. All this enthusiasm and things going, and then the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. During World War II, secession efforts were put on hold, but the state of Jefferson movement never died. Efforts to become a new state continued with each election, and today more than 20 counties are involved, but it's an uphill battle. The legislative bodies have to approve the state, and the federal government has to approve the new state. So the chances of it happening are not very high. From Wairika, home of the state of Jefferson movement, I'm John Bartell. Hope to see you on the back roads. All right, I know we covered a lot this week. We were out at Franklin Boulevard talking with lowriders. We also had Price of Care talking about conservatorships. And then, of course, teaching, the state of teaching. So if you missed any of our stories from this week, make sure you head to our website at abc10.com slash to the point. Have a great Friday. We'll see you next time. Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.